Hello, how are you? Good. Good morning. Thanks for getting out of bed to uh, uh, come see this talk. It's a delight to uh, be here again. Thank you for the sponsors for uh, uh, making all of this possible. Uh, I've got what I think is going to be a, a fun talk for you. I'm going to violate one of the uh, first rules of giving a safe, professional, well-timed, highly executed talk. I'm going to do lots of live coding. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Wish me luck. All right, so uh, you see the part at the top? That's my name, that's me. The uh, name of the talk is The Mental Game of uh, Python, and it's got a good clickbaity uh, headline, 10 Strategies That Work, which sounds kind of like over-the-top advertising, except I actually believe these are 10 strategies that work. Every one of them will sound very basic. So basic that uh, you, you might want to think that you could uh, disregard it or, or that it's unimportant. But I've come to believe that it's essential. So I've uh, uh, been answering Stack Overflow questions for years. I'm now up to 150,000 points or somewhere thereabouts. You know what you can do with 150,000 points on Stack Overflow? If you add five bucks to it, you can get a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Okay. <laughs> But you get something out of it as you answer all of those uh, questions. You learn what confuses people, what causes them to get stuck, what thinking strategies cause them to be successful. Likewise, I do a lot of coaching of uh, uh, teams. I do code uh, reviews, architecture reviews, and I train uh, programmers from intro programmers to very advanced programmers. And I've become a, uh, a student of Stack Overflow a student of my clients, and a student of my students, and a student of myself. I like to study what goes wrong, and I've kept this little black book of what is it that causes people to get stuck, and then eventually evolved into what causes them to be uh, successful, some patterns of uh, thought. So I'd like to give you those uh, uh, 10 strategies, and I hope you come to share my fascination with what is it that causes people to be stuck, what is it that causes them to be uh, uh, successful. Uh, are you ready to see all of my slides all at once? That is uh, my slide. Not slides, slide. So these are the uh, uh, strategies. Uh, well, in order to um, minimize your uh, cognitive load, what you should do is chunk thoughts together, use abstractions, and use aliasing to things you already know. Any questions? Okay. Another thing you should do is, if you have a complicated problem, don't solve that problem. Find a simpler uh, related problem, solve it. And by the way, you should develop incrementally. Don't try and do the entire uh, problem at once. Another thing is, uh, if you come from uh, other object-oriented languages, you tend to plan out your inheritance. Who needs to plan? How about just write classes and then later think about inheritance as an afterthought? Does that sound like a great idea? These things all sound like terrible uh, uh, ideas. And uh, should you write functions that have parameters? Heck no. Hardwire all of your variables. In fact, do we even need functions? No, we'll start without them. Does that sound useful to you? All of this sounds like uh, uh, terrible advice. In fact, once you've done something manually, do it again. And then maybe if a pattern emerges, move it into a, uh, a function. And uh, object-oriented programming, it's kind of a fashionable thing, something we probably ought to be doing. How should you think about object-oriented programming? Should you think about classes and instances? Heck no, let's throw that out the window. How about in, uh, encapsulation? Ah, won't think about any of that stuff. Uh, when we're doing object-oriented programming, well, we'll hit it with a completely different angle that they don't teach you in school. Does that sound useful? All of this sounds terrible. And then, very important is to throw in an acronym, ETL. I'm going to start with ETL, then I'll do my analysis, and then I'll separate from the presentation, which sounds a little bit like a breakdown of model view controller, but isn't. So kind of a design pattern, but not. And another thing is, at every step, why just do work when you can go out and uh, do some research? Work is where you write code. How about you just look at data, go around checking its type, get the length of things, looking at subsets of data, you know, just putzing around with your data instead of working. Does that sound useful? And you've got a big pile of data. You can't just look at it anymore. How about we run a sort on it? Does that sound cool? 
And finally, uh, if uh, you should use uh, sets and dictionary groupings for your primary tool for data analysis. Don't use any of that pandas stuff or, uh, or whatnot. You won't uh, be needing it. Just dicks and sets. And then uh, I'll wrap this up with something really important, a toy example that has no real world applications. Does any of this sound like it makes any sense to you? That part's called the teaser. In the end, I will show you all of these things are of profound importance. Okay. <laughs> they are life changing. They are things uh, uh, that you should do. So let's talk about chunking and aliasing. <sighs> I have a, a computer in front of me. It's very powerful. One uh, terabyte of solid state storage, 16 gigabytes of RAM. Not giga, giga, like in uh, Back to the Future. Okay, and this processor on it has 16 general purpose registers. Pretty awesome. I know what you're thinking, that's way too powerful and we need a wimpier processor, and we have one. It's much heavier than this one. It, the human head weighs eight and a half pounds. Let's study this processor. What do we know about this uh, uh, processor? How many registers do you have? The answer is something we have known for a long time, since 1956, known as Miller's Law, and this is a universal human truth. It is a cognitive capacity of human beings all across the planet at different education levels. Your register capacity is seven plus or minus uh, two. On a bad day, you've got five registers. On a good day, when you're really lucky, you've got nine. On average, about seven. Fewer registers than our CPU. And those of you who've written compilers before know that uh, when you have this few registers, you've got a problem, register starvation. Your problems require more information than fits into uh, seven uh, uh, registers, which tells you something interesting. Your brain is this big, the average problem you're solving is this big, and even if you grow your brain a little bit, it is not big enough to hold everything. Pound the table for me, I have no table left. <laughs> there must be a better way. In fact, the psychologists have taught us what to do about this. They call it chunking. Chunking is where you uh, group individual pieces of information uh, into a single chunk. The idea is if you try to remember this number, it's got too many digits in it to remember. So we chunk it as 12, 10, and 1946, creating a mnemonic for a day, month, and uh, uh, year making it possible for you to remember that number for a while. This is why we take phone numbers and group them into uh, uh, chunks. It makes it possible to keep it all in your head and working memory. So, whenever you're running low on registers, what do you need to do that rhymes with thunking and starts with CH? Chunking, that is in fact uh, uh, the case. Now, do you have to wait till you're out of registers? Heck no, because when you're solving a problem, even if it's a simple problem that only uh, requires five registers, you've got a new issue. We never solve one problem at a time, only in uh, textbooks. In the real world, you have multiple problems. So if you're working on a problem and you use up five of your registers, on an average day, you've only got two left and can't think any other uh, interesting thoughts. Do you see the problem? So whenever you start to eat up registers, what should you do? Chunk. And what that can do is take a five register problem and shrink it down to one. Can we do better than five to one? In fact, we can. We can take the one to zero. The way we do that is through a concept called aliasing. You take an existing thing you know, link the knowledge to that, and uh, through aliasing, you have two, uh, two references to the same piece of data. By the way, do you think Intel has ever heard of this technology? In fact, they have. This CPU also uses something uh, called register aliasing. So if you move one register to another, move RAX to uh, EAX, for example, on this uh, processor, often it takes zero clock cycles. Why? Because they rename the uh, uh, register. Everybody got the idea of how to go to uh, five to one? Chunking. And how do you go from one to zero? Aliasing. Okay, is that all I need to say on the subject? Or would you like me to do something dangerous? A live demonstration that could not possibly go wrong. Okay, uh, one person dared answer. The rest of you are in mortal fear of maybe something could go wrong. So I'd like to show you a cute little module called Random. By the way, uh, a little note on uh, uh, my examples. If I use some Python you don't know, that's unimportant. 
If I go uh, too fast, that's unimportant. If the example seems uninteresting, that is unimportant. The most important thing is when I'm doing this is you think about the strategy. And the strategy is aliasing and uh, uh, chunking. So there is a little function there called random. And what it does is it gives you a value of x in between 0.0, .0 and 1.0. And it is uh, a half open interval, which means that a 1 is not included. This is a rather tight range. This is a rather limited feature. Pound the table. So we need a bigger range. One thing we, uh, we could do is multiply this by 200. What that would do is take the range and multiply all the elements by 200, and that would give us a number between 0 and 200. I know what you're thinking. That's too easy. So we'll switch it to add 50. And I'll add 50 to each term, and that gives me 50 here, 250. And this gives me a uniformly distributed number uh, between uh, 50 and, why is it shrinking that way? OK, come back screen. Make it larger. Can all of you see that? You're all good, even on the back? All right. So everybody uh, learned something new about the technique of getting a uniformly distributed number between 50 and 250. Pretty easy? How many of you thought it was easy? I don't. <laughs> I don't think this is too easy because this is used up one, two, three of my seven plus or minus two, and on a bad day, I've lost half of my cognitive capacity and can't think about uh, anything else, and if you disturb me, I'll completely lose my comp concentration. Pound the table. What do you do when you start to eat up your register space? Chunk it. So, if this function didn't already exist, and it does, you should have created it for yourself, and it's called uniform. So, uniform, 50 to 250. These two pieces of code do exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. One is not better than the other computationally. However, in terms of your cognitive load, this one occupies one register and that one occupies three. Everybody got the uh, uh, basic idea? All right. So another thing that I could do is take a random number, that's a float between zero and one, multiply it by 200, giving it a bigger range, and then turn it into an integer. What that does is gives us a uh, integer in the range 0 to 200. Pretty easy. I had actually learned something like that from my basic programming book when I was 13 years old. So uh, a fairly uh, uh, a simple thing. Well, let's see if we can make it uh, a little bit more interesting and multiply that by 5. Now, this one's kind of cool because what it does is uh, change this, this range to 5,000 or to 1,000, but it does it after multiplying by f uh, the 200 steps in steps of 5, so in uh, multiples of 5. Okay. And then, of course, I could add a, uh, a base to it of 5,000, and that would uh, change the range 5,000 to 6,000 in steps of uh, five. And that's something I could uh, teach to most people in just a minute or two. Everybody got the uh, core technique of how you would do such a thing? Ah, is this code awesome? No, there's something wrong with it. What is it? It uses up one, two, three, four, five of my plus seven plus or minus two, and on a bad day, I am out of cognitive capacity, and on a good day, I have already used up more than half. There must be a better way. What is it? Chunking, where I could reduce these five registers to how many? One. So I could write a function that does this. <sighs> Isn't that great? Five to one? Can I do better? One to what? Zero. Zero. Zero is where you alias to an existing concept. Being a Python programmer, you already know the concept of range. List uh, the uh, range, and I can tell the range two to ten, or let's say uh, five to... Uh, uh, 100, how about 10 to 100, better example, and in steps of 5. The order of the arguments is start, stop, and step. How many of you already knew range? Aha! So a really good name for this uh, function is rand range. So what we had just done a moment ago 
we can describe it like this, RAND range, and this will take it down to zero registers because it's something you already uh, uh, know. Okay. How do you like that? Zero registers. Nice improvement. Now keep in mind, the random module has already done this chunking for you. My goal is that after this talk, you chunk for yourself all the time. Look at every single piece of code and say, how many registers have I used? That's too many. Can I take it to zero to one? This is the secret of improving our cognitive capacity, and we've known this for a long time. All right, we've got uh, some outcomes, and I'd like to choose one of them randomly. You could win, you could lose, you could draw, you could uh, get a double score, uh, you can try again. Okay, the number of uh, possibilities is five. And so I can index them with a zero all the way up to the last possibility is a four, so I need one of these possible numbers, one, two, three, or four as an index to choose one of them as a outcome. So I've got this plan. I, uh, I start with random, it's got a problem, it's a floating point number, and it's limited range. I expand its range by the length of the outcomes, and now I've got a number between zero and five. Unfortunately, it's a float, so I can turn it into an integer, which gives me a random index into the outcomes. And then I can uh, look it up, and this randomly chooses one of the outcomes. Simple computer technology. Any questions? Pretty easy. What's wrong with it? Too many uh, registers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Of my seven plus or minus uh, two, on a bad day, I've already gone uh, negative, I've got a headache, I'm going home and leaving the profession and becoming a flight attendant. Simpler problems, coffee, tea, or milk. Sit down, seat bits on, don't smoke. There, five registers, max capacity. All right, so there must be a better way, what is it? We could take advantage of chunking. There is another way to express this, which is outcomes, rand range, length of the outcomes. This uses fewer registers. Do you agree that it's better? Both pieces of code do exactly the same thing in the uh, same way. Computationally, they're the same. Which one is clearer that it's uh, choosing an outcome randomly in the range of the length of the outcomes? The second one, and not by a little bit. So there is less decryption effort and the total amount of decryption effort you do each day determines whether you go home happy or whether you go home with a headache. The fewer decryption steps you do, the happier you are. This isn't a hard decryption, but if you do a lot of them, it will leave you tired. Do you see the problem? Everybody agree that the second one is better? Now, do you like it? No. What's wrong with it, sir? It's still using more of my uh, registers. What should I do? Starts with a CH and rhymes with thunking. Check why, in fact, we could do that. How about uh, uh, this, choice of outcomes? Is that better? Which of these three is clearest about what it does? Computationally, they're identical. Now, we've already given you choice, uh, but if we hadn't, you should have made it for yourself. The goal is for you to apply this knowledge outside of uh, uh, this room. Easy enough? Oh, not enough uh, outcomes. Let's go make a bunch of them for I in range 10. So, actually, hold on. Here we go. For I in range 10. And this gives me 10 random outcomes, which is something I know right at the moment where I write this uh, uh, code. The problem is the number of registers this use is, is 10. This is a, a no longer decryption effort. This is a puzzle. At the moment you put it together, you fully understand it. But if this is embedded in bigger code, every time you hit this line, you're going to have to pick apart what does this thing do. It chooses 10 random uh, outcomes. Do you agree that we have register overload on that line? That is in fact the case, which raises a question, can we make it better? Absolutely, we can make it better. There. I contend that this is dramatically more readable. Can we do better? What should I use? Choice. Of these three, which is going to be clearest that it makes 
10 random choices of outcomes. Number one, number two, or number three? Which do you like best? Three. So three is pretty awesome. Do you see why we like choice and the payoff from uh, uh, chunking? Are you happy, sir? I'll ask you again. If I ever ask you the same question twice, change your answer. Are you happy? No. And you're uh, unhappy for the same reason you were unhappy before, which is what? That thing used up uh, three registers. There must be a better way. What is it? Chunk it. How about this? Choices of outcomes. Ten. Okay. Oh, man, what's going on here? Okay, oh, equal ten. Blowing my demo. What the heck is going on here? Okay, there you go. Better. Keyword-only arguments. Got to love them. Just because you write a function doesn't mean you know how to call it. So that one was me. That's actually my fault. All right. Fair enough. So I didn't actually come here to show you the random module. I came here to show you how to chunk and how you stack one chunk on top of the other. And this is a way to re uh, reduce your cognitive load and manage complexity. It is the core of our craft. It's what we're here to do. I often uh, try to describe uh, computer programming uh, to kids. How many of you can tell uh, uh, a child what a, uh, a software engineer does? At least one man uh, uh, can, one man who has. Here's my explanation. The computer gives us words that do, does things. What daddy does is make new words to make computers easier to use. That's basically our whole job. You, that new word might be an app or a, uh, a button or a database, but you make new words to make, to make computers easier to use. And we just build a big edifice of chunking. Who learned? Something new. All right, fantastic. That was uh, strategy number uh, one. Uh, what's the next strategy? Solve a, uh, a, a related but simpler problem and to do uh, incremental uh, development. So here is uh, one that came up this week. I will use idle for this. It's uh, really nice for these kind of uh, uh, demos and make it much larger for you. How about uh, that? Or am I a little too large? Open. And a learner this week presented me with, I have a bunch of JSON and I would like to find things in it. Where the heck is the nine in the uh, JSON? And an additional requirement is I might not start from the top of the tree, I might start from a, 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 a subnote. And they showed me a big pile of four note loops and ifs that they had worked on and they said, it doesn't work. And I didn't read the code carefully and I said, I believe you. <laughs> I have no doubt. And they said, what would you do? Well, I would apply the Feynman method of uh, solving problems. How many of you know the Feynman methods of solving problems? Oh, you guys have got to know this is rather famous. Uh, Feynman said, write down a clear problem specification. Number two, think very, very hard. Number three, write down a solution. <laughs> and you laugh, but that's what he did. He took problems, wrote them down, thought very, very hard, uh, deeply about them, and wrote down a solution. So here's the problem to be solved. Given a, a target, find the uh, path to it, starting with any node in the tree. So if we're looking for the number seven up here, the path to it is start with the tree, square brackets two for a dictionary, square brackets three, and square brackets seven. And the person who had come to me had uh, very little experience with writing recursive programs. If you'd like to get expert at this style, I highly recommend uh, the MIT book, The Little Schemer. It's how I learned it, and it takes no programming background. In fact, I expect to work my son through that book before he finishes uh, third grade. He can uh, completely master recursion then. So what is our strategy? Solve a simpler but uh, a related problem. And because I am using pre-made solutions up here, they were the actual solutions I did, but I'm bringing them because I need to go quickly and we're not, uh, unlike when I'm teaching elsewhere where I want people to know the Python, here, what's the most important thing I'm uh, uh, covering? The strategy. So the uh, simpler problem is just count the number of occurrences of blue. So I make a function called uh, uh, countum that takes a node like a tree an arbitrary node, 
and a, a, a list. And its goal, again, write down what you want to do before you do it, is count the occurrences of the, a uh, target. Uh, that should probably be called target instead of list. That'd be a much better name. Of the target in the list. So should I try and solve the entire problem at once? No, I'll start with the simplest case where the node is uh, uh, the target. And this is called the atomic case. If the node is equal to the uh, target, well, then we've got one occurrence. Okay. However, if it's not, then there are no occurrences. So I could run this one, and we could check uh, uh, count them. Is blue and green the same node? True or false? No. There are no matches. Is blue the uh, same as blue? Yes. How many uh, should we get? Okay, so that takes care of the case where you've actually found something, you can get an account for it. Everybody clear on what that does? This code is not difficult uh, to write. The next case is that we encounter a, uh, a list of, uh, of values. So let's say I have a list of red, blue, red, green, and I want to count the number of occurrences of red. Now I know that there's already a function that uh, does for this for us. However, I'd like to just to go through the uh, uh, thinking style. What we can do is I don't want to use some other function to go in here. Do we already have something that counts? Yes, and it can count an exact match. So we want to make break the more complex problem down into simpler problems. So if is instance, if the node is a list, we're not going to count. What we're going to do is do a, a, a sub problem for sub node in the list, or in the uh, uh, node. We'll want to call count them again for the sub node and pass through our uh, a target. In other words. For each one of these nodes, we're going to do a count them for it, and we'll get a, a zero one. So this would return a number. And suppose we got some numbers back, uh, one, zero, one, uh, one. What should we do to get the grand total? Sum them up. So this is fairly easy to do. We can return the sum of counting them up for every node in the subnode. Run that, and we can now go look for uh, blue in perhaps, actually I'm going to look for, uh, take our existing list, which is our node. And I will go and look for red. And that gives the expected three. What should blue give us? And uh, purple. Zero. So does that work uh, uh, reasonably well? In fact, that's the case. Interestingly, what we try a more advanced case. What if it is nested? Okay, purple. We'll just go straight to uh, red, and we still get three. Presto, recursion came uh, uh, fairly easily. So that takes care of a simple case list. But then we've got another case, which is uh, dictionaries. If is instance, if the node is a dictionary, what we'd like to do is break that down into smaller pieces. I'm uh, not interested in the key. I'm interested in the value. How do you get all of the values in a uh, dictionary? If dot keys gives you all the keys, how do you get all of the values? Values, OK. Notice how I give away the answer to the question in the uh, question. So this time, the subnode comes from the node.values. Uh, and I can go test this on the entire tree. Okay, and count them. 
three, red, and blue. Not as awesome as I expected. What's that? All caps. All caps. Um, where? Oh, right. Pair programming is where you have a second person looking over your shoulder, catching your errors. I practice Centena programmer. A uh, hundred parent programmers looking over, catching. All right. So, notice how I solve these one at a pro, uh, time. On Stack Overflow, I routinely find people posting questions where they've got 50 lines of recursive code, and their question is, it's broken in there somewhere. Now, I'm pretty good at finding their bug, and I tell them the answer, and I say, oh, you've got a uh, bug on line 25, uh, you're missing a comma. And give them that answer, I get 10 points of uh, upvotes, and eventually you get 150,000 uh, points. However, if there's somebody who I've taught before, I would say, your engineering technique is really bad. You don't have 50 problems, you have one. And if you were testing this line, and then grew it to this line, and then this line broke, 100% of the time, you'd know exactly where the problem is. It's in the line of code you just wrote. So if you're ever posting a question on Stack Overflow that says it's broken in there somewhere, your engineering technique is terrible. So this was the uh, simpler sub-problem. And because this is not going nearly as rapidly as I uh, expected, I, will still, I think I can still get the uh, gist of this through CD, ch -ch K in, after, and, Now that you've got the flow of the technique, we've solved the simpler problem, you've seen the incremental development, I could repeat those steps again on the more complex problem, but it is essentially the same logic, except this time, when I uh, loop over the node, I enumerate it. And when I find it, I return a path. An F string says, I'm going to put in the, uh, uh, the square brackets and I, the index. And it says, if we find one, just return where it is and the path. And this one uh, for dictionary says, if we find one, we'll also use square brackets, but we'll use the wrapper of uh, uh, the key. Otherwise, the logic is identical to up here. We have a more complex return. And so uh, the example of count of uh, path to ABC to ABC, the exact case is if the target node matches, we return an arrow and what the target is. If we have something more interesting, like a list, what we do is loop over that list one at a time, recording the position. Position zero, one, two, three, four. And we ask, uh, is there a path to it? And the moment it returns one of these, we know that we've got a hit. So we augment the path with the square brackets i. In this case, it says at position three is the uh, ABC. We can try a nested case to see if that one uh, uh, works as well. And uh, through the magic of recursion, we automatically got the second level for free. For the uh, uh, dictionary, we loop over the items, and it's just like doing a, a numerate. The, uh, and this time, instead of an index, we've got the key. So we report the key, and what's done differently this time is we show the wrapper of the uh, key, which puts quotes around uh, strings so that we can get the uh, path here. So square brackets uh, uh, one, square brackets zero takes us to ABC. And then finally, I'll do my original problem, which is find the path to seven. And it's fairly easy to prove that this is the path because I take the tree, lay in the path, and it gives us uh, seven. As I say en français, voila. I'm not here to teach you recursion. I'm not te here to teach you F-strings. I'm here to teach you two strategies. They work. I want to give you a non-trivial uh, uh, problem. I don't think this is a hard problem, but this is a methodology that scales very well.
to hard problems. And it's how I pick apart really good problems. And uh, when you're doing interview problems, one of the things that they're looking for is not just a solution in the interview, they're looking for how you think about the problems. Do you take the problem and decompose it into smaller problems? Do you start thinking uh, uh, incrementally? Uh, that said, there's a step that you should do uh, in the real world that you should never do in the interview. What is that? Check the Python package index to see if someone's already solved the problem. <laughs> All good practitioners say, I go to the Python package index, pip install, it's done. And the interviewer's like, uh, that's cheating. And you're like, maybe I should be your boss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cheating is what we do. Somebody's already made a word to make computers easier to use. All we have to do is say the word. All right, everybody got the idea of that uh, particular strategy? Any questions on solving simpler but related problems and incremental development? They're not just buzzwords. They are legitimate, powerful strategies for fairly uh, uh, hard problems. Okay, I now have so many screens up, I no, no longer know where I am. Okay, the next one is really easy. Build classes independently and let inheritance discover itself. So back when I was a hardcore C++ programmer, and then later I discovered Java and thought it was so much better, and it was, I had uh, studied object-oriented modeling techniques, and I learned the predecessors of UML, and I made myself nice inheritance uh, diagrams uh, that related to the entity relationship diagrams I had learned earlier in life. I learned to make a plan. Are you impressed? Why don't chess players think or professional chess players think more than 10 moves in advance. It's a high stakes game. You can get a million dollar purse for winning the game. Shouldn't you think more than 10 moves in ahead? Why not? Ah, there's too many. Combinatoric explosion. So uh, you, the idea is each move in the game t updates the state and teaches you something new about the path that you didn't knew b know before. And so you're walking through the fog and at each step in the fog you can see uh, further. And there's an important lesson in this. A lot of our problems, real world problems, aren't tic-tac-toe problems where you can see to the end. They are chess problems where you can't. So the idea of fully planning all of this in advance, the waterfall model, sometimes works when the solution is well known. Otherwise, uh, we prefer more agile methods of letting the inheritance uh, discover itself. So I'd like to show you a fun example. Do not get lost in the descriptors here. That is not the interesting part. It is the uh, strategy. Our problem is to build a collection of data validation utilities using uh, descriptors. If you don't know descriptors, don't get lost in this. I will teach you that at uh, some other time. <clears throat> the, important thing is the strategy. So here's an example of how to use them. We have a class called resource and the resource ID we decide must be a number with a minimum value of zero. A name must be a string with a minimum size of two and a maximum size of 20. And the category must be assigned one of these variables pending, idle, active, or shutdown. Our goal is to make some classes that make that work. So we build a class number that accepts a minimum value and a maximum value. One of the nice uh, uh, features in later Pythons is something called F name, set name. Won't spend much time on it now, but it's really awesome for writing descriptors like this. It lets the descriptor know its own variable name. So at the time we make number, we don't know that it's going to be assigned a resource ID. The instance gets created first and this happens after. What self set name does is causes the resource class to notify number and say, by the way, I named your instance uh, resource ID. Get runs when you do a get. Set runs when you do a set, which is why it's called get and set, which teaches the, you the value of naming things very plainly. Fair enough. Well, I say name things every, very plainly. Take a look at dun, uh, dunder loader, dunder spec, and then see if you can guess what they are. Not everything is named plainly, but it should be. So this, the get is not terribly interesting. It looks up the private name for a variable and retrieves it. The set starts out not very interesting. It just stores to the private variable. The interesting part is this. Before we actually store the value, we validate it. If it's not an integer or float, is it a number? No. If the type is wrong, what kind of error should you, should you give? 
If the type is wrong, what kind of error should you raise? Type error. That is, in fact, the case. But if the type is correct and the value is wrong, what kind of error should you raise? Value error. And we always check type before we check value. So this is really nice error message technique. Instead of saying, nope, I won't take it, you should say, I expected uh, this value to be an integer or float. I expected this value to be at least the minimum. Does everybody see how roughly how this will validate an assignment to resource ID to make sure that it's a number in a particular range? Okay, That's not the interesting part. Next one is string. And it works in very much the same way. It has a uh, different dunder init because we're saving min size, max size, and a possible predicate like stir upper. This also has a set name and a get name. And before we store, we check the type and can raise value errors if it's below the minimum size, above the maximum, or if the predicate is not true. Everybody get roughly how string works. But I'm not done. How many classes uh, did I need? One, two, three. How many have I got? Two. So I should use an advanced technology called cut and paste and uh, then start modifying it to, to make choices. Do you agree? No, that's a terrible idea. Was it a reasonable idea to have done this twice? Yes, because it taught me what the uh, uh, commonalities are. So I'll make a new class called validator. And validator, I'll look to see what is in common down here. One thing that is in common is the uh, get name and the get and the set name. Because that's in common, I move it up. This is very easy to do. I might already have passing test uh, at this point. I can uh, uh, run and make sure that I haven't damaged the code in any way. And I'll let these inherit from validator. because that was the code that was in, com uh, in common. Notice that I'm making the parent class after the two child classes. This is a somewhat uh, reliable technique for finding out what is truly in common as opposed to trying to plan it in advance, which makes this a harder problem. Now the dunder inits are completely different. I look at the sets. Is there something similar about the two sets? Yes, the final step. The other part isn't. So I get this bright idea. How do I make them the same? This is a easily learned skill. So I'll use an advanced technology known as cut and paste, move it down, and create another method, the distinct part. And I'll call this method validate. And val validate just takes a method and validates it. It doesn't set it. Up here, to complete that factoring, self.validate the value. Now, I do the same factoring down below. The two validate methods are different. What is now the same, or will be the same when I finish doing it correctly? Help me out here. Don't make me feel all alone. It's the uh, dunder set. So I cut that out and move it up. And at this point, number is fairly uh, simple. What are the constraints on the number? And uh, what type of validation do you want to do on it? All knowledge of what it means to be a number is in this class. But all knowledge of how to validate is up here. All of the knowledge of descriptors, the part that some of you might consider the hard part, is up here. And down below to make new instances or new classes, you don't need to know anything about descriptors. You need to inherit from what? validator, which lets us uh, complete our task somewhat straightforwardly. Class one of is a validator. And so having established the uh, uh, pattern, it is not difficult to go forward. The init is we save what are all of the possible choices. That is the API up above, one of pending idle. So I don't, Ideally, whenever you're going to use the in operator, you should use it on sets. They're very fast. Their special skill is that they're very good at fast membership testing. So we convert it to a set. And the other thing we need to do is validate a value. And it's quite easy to do. If the value is not in, 
we'll say, how about this? Allow, uh, allow, we'll give it a good, how allowed options. Is that a better name? Yeah. If it's not in the allowed op options, if the value is bad, what kind of error should we raise? Yeah, raise value error. And, yeah. And I raise a uh, value error. And should I give it an excellent uh, error message saying, I got this value, expected one of those options? Yes, but not what you're in your own stage. You'll just quote Homer Simpson. <laughs> and it takes about one minute to write this class. How much planning did I do? Not a whole lot. I wrote a number class. I hacked on it for a while till I got it to work. Once I, ha I had that down, I went and made another class. I discovered the commonalities, and then I immediately moved it up into another class. At that point, I kept on going, and my later work was simple. What does uh, Daddy do for a living? By the way, I keep asking that because there is a little boy uh, uh, present. Matthew is over here, and his lesson today, uh, it's, uh, he just finished his second day of uh, second grade. And right after this, we're going to be working on flow charts, loops, and recursion. I, uh, <laughs> you guys think I'm kidding. He's a fairly insightful little boy. I showed him uh, uh, flow charts earlier in the week, the little diamond for a decision. And uh, this morning, I told him, I'm going to teach you loops today. And he said, what is that? And I said, the arrow comes out of the diamond and goes back up. And I was astonished. He said, what if you never get out? Oh, thank you, God. The apple does not fall far from the tree. <clears throat> or in our case, trees. Rachel is also a computer programmer, and so she's over here. <clears throat> All right. These are very teachable skills, and I'm less interested in him learning programming and more interested in him learning strategies of problem-solving skills so that if he decides that he wants to be something else, these skills will carry over elsewhere to life. And if he wants to know what his daddy does for a living, I make new words to make computers easier to use. Fair enough? All right. Uh, how much time have I got, sir? Do you know? 15 minutes. Outstanding. Let's do it again. I know what you're thinking. Classes are uh, uh, too easy. So let me uh, make a XML conversion example. And this will require a little bit more intensity on my part, so. Open. Our uh, problem is to convert a CSV file to uh, Excel. Uh, I'll show you the uh, CSV file real quick. Let's e Raisin Team CSV. If you were in one of my classes, this is a rather famous file. So it's just a, uh, a CSV file of people's contact information at a certain raisin company. Okay. And I've started out with the CSV part already parsed because it's not what we're here to learn. And it's pretty easy. Open the file, use the CSV reader, extract the fields, and I've printed the uh, uh, fields. My goal is to go build uh, XML. And my favorite of the XML tools is Elementary. And what we're going to need for it is a couple of things. Element, what do you think Element does? It builds in Element. And what do you think would be a useful debugging tool to see what uh, you've done? Okay, but I find that uh, even amongst uh, programmers with medium experience, like been doing this for uh, several years, they struggle with this. Why? Because their strategy is not awesome. We're paying less attention to the answer here, and more attention to the uh, strategy for getting it. We're going to repeat a task manually, hardwiring thing, until what happens? I'm pointing at the answer, it's not a hard question. Until what happens? Until the patterns emerge. Then what we do, do we do? Only then move it to a function. I can't count the number of people who immediately make their life worse by the first word they type is deaf. If the first word they type is deaf, then the only way to see what's going on inside is with print statements or with a debugger or breakpoint. Barry's here. You love breakpoint? He's the man. And I was dubious at first, but I use it a lot. That said, 
he only got the ball halfway uh, down the field because the one I really want is the most magic power of uh, PDB. It's one called PM, post-mortem. You don't have to set the breakpoint in advance. You can let your program die, resurrect it after the fact, and I would just love a built-in PM that says, resume my program right at the point where it died. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Barry says, submit a patch. <laughs> you know what happens if you submit a PR on this sort of thing? It might get accepted. That would be terrible. What if you do another one? It might get accepted. Then something terrible would happen to you. You might be given commit privileges, and then for the rest of your life, work for free. <clears throat> it could happen. Good news is if you do a decent job, Every year at your performance review, uh, Quito will say, I'm going to double your salary. <laughs> and for 17 years, every year, he's doubled. Well, there was one year where I kind of flitzed a little bit. So halved my salary one year. But mostly uh, 15 doublings, one halving, and uh, got me to where I am today. All right. <clears throat> you think that's a joke. We pay nothing. Literally. Zero. All right. So root is uh, the uh, root element. So, all right, oh. Okay, and <clears throat> let's see. We'll uh, call it a contact list. And pass in perhaps some uh, attributes like the uh, status is public and the company is, can't use the real company's name. This is actually a real problem. Raisins RS Incorporated. The real company has a lady on the red box. Okay. Okay. And you debug as you go with dump root. Okay. Put that at the top of the screen so that more of you can see it. Run this little bit of code. And running the wrong one. Never talk and type at the same time. All right, we got a little bit of uh, XML, not terribly exciting. There is no data in it. The next thing to do is to create a, uh, a person element. And attach it to a parent. The way you grow a list is with a append, and the way you grow elements is with a, uh, a append. So we attach it to the parent. And now we have a contact list, which is a li uh, list of uh, persons. I know what you're thinking. This XML looks ugly, and it should. If it ever looks beautiful, it's wrong. When you, not kidding. <laughs> the moment somebody indents or pretty print this, they're actually changing the data content of the uh, XML. Surprisingly enough, if you put a space right here, you are adding uh, a data content into non-leaf uh, non nodes. So I'm going to do something that is not normally done in regular XML, but will help us uh, quite a bit during uh, debugging. I'm going to set the text to a new line. And the part after the closer is called the tail. Set it to a new line. You would almost never do this in real XML. And I will do that with the person as well. The person's uh, text is a new line. And the uh, person's tail is a new line. This is done for beautification. And now you see a big pile of XML over here. Let me see if I can range, range my screen for a different view. So you see the maximum amount of uh, uh, code. All right. Everybody see a contact list with a whole bunch of persons in it. Okay. Not terribly exciting. Incremental development. The next thing I'm interested in is a uh, new element, a person's full name. Don't put spaces here. It's bad for you. Okay. The full name's text is easy to make. F strings are a wonderful thing. Marietta, are you here? OK. She would tell you they are a wonderful thing. OK. So we've got the uh, first name and the uh, uh, last name might be my presentation style here. And I'll do something unusual. Set the tail equal to a new, new line and attach it to its uh, parent root uh, or person dot append the full uh, first name. All right. So now 
we've got a contact list with people in it, and each person has a, uh, a full name. Do you, we'll do uh, one more, which is TI is an element. All right, I'll call it, how about JT? An element is the job title. And the job titles, uh, text is the title that we extracted from the CSV, and we'll uh, attach to it a tail and attach it to the parent. And now every person, ooh, did I, I attach the wrong one. Now there's no evidence of my mistake. It never happened. All right. And so what we're seeing over here is the world's slowest output screen. And it shows us that a person now has a full name and a job title. Do you see how I'm building up the XML? How many more fields do, do I have to go? Three more, but I don't have enough time. If I wanted to waste my life like this, I'd still be a COBOL programmer. Pound the table. <laughs> there must be a better way. We've done this manually. We've hardwired a bunch of steps but we've done enough to let the pattern establish itself. Are these two in the same pattern? I use an advanced technology known as cut and paste. Move it up and put it in a function. And what this does is, this function is it adds full name. An interesting thing to note here is I'm not modifying the, bo uh, the body at all. All I do is put in add fn. This is a very minimal transformation. Most of you are capable of doing more steps than this, but on more complex problems, breaking it down into small steps keeps you moving forward. I check and make sure that it still works. We've accomplished nothing except moved it into a function, and my friend Grant here would say, can you believe there are functions that are only called one time? We have a solution to that problem. It's called inlining. But I'm going the other way because I want to call it more than uh, once. So I take a look at the difference between what's in this function and this function. And one thing that's different is instead of full name, it's a job title. What do you call a uh, constant that changes? A variable. A good name for this is tag. So I'll pass it in and make sure it still works. Note the very slow, methodical approach to where I always have something working. And I can either use version control or control Z if I mess anything up. This saves me from uh, lots of debugging efforts, and I don't go home every day with a uh, uh, headache. Uh, here, we assign the title. Up here, we did the first name and last name. Is that the same or different? What do you uh, call uh, a constant that changes? A variable. So this one should be called the uh, text. And put that in right here, and make sure that it still works. Now, we believe that we've isolated all of the uh, major differences, not some uh, uh, minor differences, and I want to verify the generalization. The way I do that is comment it out and try add fn again to make sure it uh, generalizes, put in the uh, job title, pass in the uh, title, and verify that it still works. Once it still works, I want to make sure this thing is fully general. Before I use the name FN, uh, why did I call it FN? Yeah, that's exactly the case because it was the full name. So as you do these generalizations, you use more general uh, names. So add FN becomes add element. And instead of uh, the variable name FN, we should just call it Elm is the uh, tra traditional name. That said, be careful with uh, global search and replace. All right. <clears throat> and where did I just kill it? Uh, got... Never code live. Who's? Who... Oh, the CSV reader got it uh, there as well. Thank you. The other interesting question is, by what procedure should an audience shout out answers simultaneously using uh, different reference points and have me process it and understand what you said? That is interesting in and of itself. Having verified the generalization, now we go forward. 
Do you notice how this is the same general procedure as I used last time for validators? And so this problem becomes fairly uh, uh, easy. I would like the uh, work phone. to be the phone number and add an element. Notice that these last parts take seconds uh, to do. Work email, email, run. As they say en français, voila. That's close to my entire French vocabulary, but it's a great word. All right. I'm less interested in the XML here and more interested in we discovered this function rather than writing it uh, uh, in advance. Who learned something new? Exercise left to the reader. It doesn't apply here. There's something wrong. This looks quite similar, but this time are we attaching to something uh, 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 different than person? Yeah, what do you, uh, so, what you'll find as you do this is you generalize for a while until you bump into a place where it doesn't apply and then generalize again. So in this case, we're changing what we attach to uh, the uh, parent. So I'll pass in parent. In this case, the, uh, the ones that we just did were person, comma, make sure it still works. Where did I mess it up? There you go. Where the red dot was, yes. All right. You're shockingly task saturated when you're doing this on, uh, on stage. All right, and at uh, that point, we're able to generalize this further and say, add element to root called person, and the text is a new line. Comment this out, verify that it still works. Change uh, what? Uh, yeah. Uh, this should be parent. Yep. Sometimes it's easier to let uh, Python just uh, tell you what it doesn't like. It takes you right to the uh, line, but not today. Okay, ah, we don't have a person. We'll need one. And so when you create an element, you should return it. And this thing becomes more useful. If it works, I knock this part out. This part is irritating because as I start to do uh, non-leaf nodes, this will become a norm. So this becomes a useful default value. <clears throat> I didn't plan this in advance. I let it discover. <clears throat> there is, I don't, I'm uh, pretty much out of time, so I'll just mention one other trick. <clears throat> if the parent is not none, <clears throat> touch it. Why do we need to do that? If you go up your ancestry tree far enough, you get to Adam and Eve. They have no parents, so you can't uh, attach them. And that will be the generalization necessary for here, that and star star quarks. Which will make it generalized to this one. And the whole thing will condense to a tiny amount of code that you can now show to another human being who's not a programmer. You skip over the add element part because it has a name add element. And you say, I'm going to create a root element called contact list with status, public, company is our, our, our raisins. I'll uh, access the CSV file, parse it up, and then I'm going to uh, add a, a person uh, to the root, and then I'll add full name, job title, and you can explain it in English to another human being while showing them your code because it's fully factored. This is what we do for a living. This is our, uh, uh, these are strategies that will work for you all the time. Uh, there are more of these, and I wish I had another 20 minutes because this one is so awesome. I just have to show you the graph. Here, I'll leave it up, and you can just ponder it for a moment. This is my uh, notion of, uh, can I take another minute and a half? Yes. Two? Yes. Yes, yes. She says yes. Oh, wait, she didn't say yes, but she's the chair, but you know how it is. You have to uh, bow to your audience. 
So the, <laughs> this is kind of an insurrection, isn't it? <clears throat> a mutiny. <clears throat> we know how we handle mutineers. It's, I'm doomed. So here's my notion of object-oriented programming. You don't write classes. Why not? Because lots of great classes have already been written for you. And not just the ones that are in the core of Python. Download more from the Python package index. You don't need to be in the class writing business. And you don't need to write for loops. And you don't need to uh, write uh, ifs and whatnot. Why not? Because what is the science of object-oriented programming in a language that has a rich ecosystem? It is take a whole bunch of tools that each have capabilities that you uh, want and figure out how to traverse in between them. So the island of integer is really good at add, subtract, multiply, and divide. The island of stir is upper and lower case and other string operations. The island of file knows how to read and write from files. The island of list is really good at mutating, appending, and uh, uh, sorting. The island of dictionary is good at looking things up, and the island of uh, set is good at union, intersection, and difference. Is it fair to say each of these tools has a different specialty? So here's the art. You figure out what island you're on, and figure out which island has the capability you need, and then it simply becomes a graph traversal problem. How do you get there? I had an example for you called Capricar's constant that involved taking a number, converting it to a string. I need to get to the island of lists so I can sort all of the digits in the string. However, there's no direct flights from integer to list. So you go through uh, Frankfurt and our uh, Charles de Gaulle, and, uh, which is the island of string. And the way to get there is stir airlines, R for format airlines. Once you're there, you want to go to the island of list. And there's a couple ways to get there. You can split it or list it. If you want separate digits, you use lists. Separate words, split. On the island of list, you can sort. That's a fun thing that we can do there. Later, I need to add the sort, uh, subtract the sorted digits from one another. You can't subtract on the island of list, so you go up back up to the island of integer. There's no direct flights, so the reverse trip is the op inverse of uh, split is what? Join which takes you to stir, and then from stir, you do int to get back to int. Uh, I would like to briefly show you the uh, 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 code for that, and like very briefly, the hook is coming. Oh, this, the cap funk. This little bit of code here says start with an integer, convert it to a string. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with uh, this one, the unfactored version. Go to the, uh, convert it to a string, and then go from string to list. While you're at list, you can do its capability of sorting. Now, go back from uh, list to stir with join, and go all the way back to integer with int, which gives you the bigger number in this sorted uh, sequence. These digits are sorted ascending and descending. Do it again for the small number, and that is uh, that implements what is called the Capricar process. What I like about this is in other languages, you approach this problem very differently. Uh, you, do, you chop off digits modulo 10 and whatnot. But in Python, you could just dance from island to island and just say, I need to go from the island of uh, uh, numbers to strings, strings to list, where I can sort and work my way back. Once you have it working, you factor it, and it becomes very close to the original problem description, which is take uh, any uh, a number, make it four digits long uh, by prepending zeros as uh, necessary, sort it a, uh, descending, or ascending, sort it descending, and subtract the two. What I find interesting about this is people who've been practicing for a Python, uh, Python for a while, given this problem, can often go straight to this answer. But it's a very teachable skill, and the way you uh, get people to this level of capability very quickly is they need to, at some point, build this object model in their math, a mind, which says, I have a this, how do I get to a that? I have a file, how do I sort all the lines? You do a read lines, you call sort on it, you join it together in a string, and write it to a file. In other words, programming in object-oriented languages becomes a graph traversal uh, problem. How many of you found that to be a useful insight worth the three minutes that I took when given to? <laughs> Thank you so much. Raymond Hattinger, thank you. 
And so for that, every, if everybody can in the back, uh, behind the video guy, can turn the seats around so that we can turn the room quicker, quicker that would be great. Thank you so much. Break time. <laughs> <laughs>